Thank you, Professor uh, Dupre, for that very, very kind introduction. And I know my topic tonight is natural theology, but um, rather than sacred theology, but you may see a miracle if I get through this because <laughs> my flight arrived very late last night. I don't think we got here to the seminary until close to 3 a.m. So, uh, and then I had to get up at 8 to, to do some classes today. So, um, so I'm going on very little sleep. It's like being in grad school again. So, so my topic uh, tonight is the nature of God as that is understood within the classical theist tradition. And I'll also say something about how that understanding differs from what uh, Father Brian Davis calls the theistic personalist conception of God, and which the Protestant philosopher Norman Geisler has also aptly labeled the neo-theist conception of God. Classical theism is represented by such thinkers as St. Augustine, St. Anselm, and St. Thomas Aquinas. Theistic personalism, or neo-theism, is represented by prominent contemporary philosophers of religion like Alvin Plantinga and Richard Swinburne. To a first approximation, the difference between the views is this. For the theistic personalist, the way to start working out the nature of God um, is to begin with the idea that God is a kind of person, like us, but without our limitations. The classical theist, by contrast, holds that the way to start is instead by thinking of God as the ultimate reality, and in particular, the ultimate explanation of why anything exists at all. These different starting points lead the two views to very different end results. To be sure, both views do affirm some of the same divine attributes, including personal attributes such as intellect and will. But they understand these attributes in very different ways. And the theistic personalist ends up with a conception of God which, in the view of classical theists, is too anthropomorphic and, in, in, and inadvertently blurs the distinction between the creator and the created. It will be useful for the purposes of this talk if you'd have a sense of exactly how the classical theist takes God to be the ultimate explanation of why anything exists. So let me begin by briefly summarizing a couple of representative arguments, namely what I call the Aristotelian proof of God's existence and the Thomistic proof of God's existence. These are arguments that I develop and defend at length in my recent book, Five Proofs of the Existence of God, and, and in other places too. But again, for present purposes, I'll just give you a quick summary. And here we're at the top, by the way, of that, that uh, handout. It provides you a little road map to uh, what I'll be talking about tonight. So the Aristotelian proof begins from the fact that change occurs, and it argues that what change involves is the actualization of a potential. For example, when an ice cube melts, the potential that the frozen water has to be in a liquid state is actualized. The proof then proceeds to argue that a potential can be actualized only by what is already actual. For example, the warmth of the air around the ice cube is already actual, and so it can actualize the potential liquidity of the water. By the same token, if what is doing the actualizing is itself going from potential to actual, then it will require some other already actual thing to actualize it. Hence the air around the ice cube might be warm only because a central heating unit is keeping it warm. Thus we have a series of actualizers of potential. A potential is actualized by something already actual, but that something is itself actual only because some third thing is actualizing it, and so on. Okay, that's how the argument gets started. Then the, the next stage of the proof is to draw a distinction between uh, what Thomas sometimes called a linear series of actualizers and a hierarchical series of actualizers, of causes. A linear series extends forward and backward in time. For example, the ice cube is melted by the warmth of the surrounding air, the air is now warm because the central heating unit had earlier been switched on. The unit was switched on because you had earlier started to feel cold, and so forth. The members of a hierarchical series, by contrast, all exist simultaneously at the same moment of time. For example, the ice cube exists here and now only because the potential of its atoms to constitute water molecules specifically, rather than some other kind of molecule, is actualized here and now. The atoms, in turn, exist here and now only because the potential of the subatomic particles to constitute atoms is actualized here and now, and so forth. So a hierarchical series is vertical, horizontal, existing at a certain moment, any, any given moment or snapshot of time. Hierarchical series are metaphysically more fundamental than linear series because a thing first has to exist at any given moment in time in order to manifest any changes over time. Now, the Aristotelian proof argues that a hierarchical series of actualizers must, of metaphysical necessity, terminate in a first member. For each member of such a series has actualizing power only in a derivative or borrowed way. 
and nothing could have derivative or borrowed power without something to derive or borrow it from. The ice cube is actual here and now only because its atoms constitute water molecules here and now. And that is true only because the subatomic particles constitute the atoms here and now. One level of reality is actualized by another level only because that other is in turn being actualized here and now by yet another. Now the only thing that can terminate this regress is something that can actualize without itself having to be actualized. And that would be something which is, as it were, already fully or purely actual. So there must be, here and now, and at any moment at which we're considering the question, a purely actual actualizer, which is what ultimately actualizes the existence of the ice cube, or of anything else that we might start our inquiry with. And this idea of a purely actual actualizer, of what Aristotle and Aquinas call the unmoved mover, or the prime mover of the world, is the core of the Aristotelian proof's conception of God, from which everything else follows, including some of the attributes we're going to talk about this evening. Okay, so that, <coughs> stated in a very compressed way, is the Aristotelian proof. Now let me briefly summarize the Thomistic proof for God's existence. It begins with the distinction between the essence and the existence of a thing. The essence of a thing is what it is, whereas its existence is the fact that it is. So suppose, to clarify this distinction and illustrate it, suppose a child has never before heard of a lion or a Tyrannosaurus rex or a unicorn and I give him a complete description of the nature or essence of each of these things. Then I tell him that of these three animals, one exists today, one used to exist but has gone extinct, and one, one of them never existed. I ask him if he can tell me which is which on the basis of the knowledge that he now has of the essences or natures of each of these things, of the description I've told him of what each of them is, what kind of creature each of them is. Of course, he'd be unable to do so, which illustrates the point that the existence of a thing if, it, if, it, if we're talking about a thing that does exist, is something distinct from and additional to its essence or nature. Okay, so that's the, the essence-existence distinction in Thomas Aquinas. Now, that's the first stage of the proof. The proof then proceeds to argue that anything whose essence or nature is distinct from its existence must have existence imparted to it from outside by something that already exists. And this is true at any moment at which it exists, and not merely at the moment in the past when it was first generated. Here and now, it has to have something adding existence to its essence or nature. For example, for the ice cube that I spoke of earlier, to exist here and now, there must be something imparting existence to it here and now, because its essence is here and now distinct from its existence. But if what is imparting existence to it here and now is itself something whose essence is distinct from its existence, then that too requires something to impart existence to it here and now. As with the Aristotelian proof, the first one I summarized, what we have here is a hierarchical series of causes, and as with the Aristotelian proof, the series cannot go on to infinity because each member described so far has only borrowed or derivative causal power. The existence of the ice cube here and now is imparted to it by some other thing which is also here and now having existence imparted to it, and if the series continues in this way ad infinitum, we will just keep passing the metaphysical buck and never arrive at an actual explanation of the ice cube's existence. The only thing that can end this regress is something in which there is no distinction between its essence and its existence, something whose very essence just is existence, what Aquinas calls subsistent being itself. So the ice cube, or again anything else that, uh, with which we begin our inquiry, can exist here and now and at any moment only if, either directly or indirectly, it has existence imparted to it here and now by a cause which just is subsistent being itself. And that is the core of the Thomistic proof's conception of God from which everything else we say about God follows. <clears throat> okay, that's in summary uh, two of these lines of argument for the existence of God understood as what keeps things going at any moment, keeps the ice cube or you or the chair you're sitting in or anything else, keeps it in existence, keeps, as the kids might say, keeps it real. God's keeping it real here and now. <laughs> keeping the world, keeping everything that exists real from moment to moment to moment to moment. And without his continual sustaining action, the world would blink out. That's the idea, uh, the conclusion to which both these lines of argument lead. Now, on analysis, it turns out that anything that is subsistent being itself, to use St. Thomas's formulation, would have to be purely actual, to use Aristotle's formulation. And anything that is purely actual would have to be subsistent being itself. The, the, the concepts end up being interchangeable. 
So the Aristotelian proof and the Thomistic proof each arrive at the existence of one and the same divine first cause by different roots. Indeed, monotheism follows from the idea that God's essence and existence are identical, that he is purely actual. Because in order for there to be more than one instance or member of a kind or class of things, if you're going to say maybe there's two or 28 gods, there's going to be more than one member or instance of any category of things, if we're going to treat God as kind of a class or category of things, then there'd have to be a distinction in each member of the class or category between its essence and its existence, and between the ways in which it is actual and the ways in which it's potential. For example, though they have the same canine essence in common, Fido and Rover, two dogs, can be distinct from one another because this essence is embodied in two different bits of matter. The matter that makes up Fido's body and the matter that makes up Rover's body. In general, matter is what differentiates different individual members of any class of physical things. But being material entails having potentiality. If you're material, you've got potentiality. For example, material things are always changeable in various ways. And to be changeable entails having potentiality. So if something is purely actual and thus lacks potentiality, as the sustaining cause of the world is, then it cannot be material. And in that case, you cannot distinguish one purely actual thing from another in the way that you can distinguish one physical thing from another. So to distinguish one physical thing from another, they've each got to have different bits of matter they're associated with. But that involves having potentiality. But a purely actual actualizer of things has no potentiality. So you can't distinguish one from another by pointing to different bits of matter they're associated with. Or consider angels, which are not physical things. Gabriel and Michael share the same angelic essence, but they can nevertheless be distinct angels because the existence of Gabriel is distinct from the existence of Michael, to appeal once again to St. Thomas's essence-existence distinction. For Aquinas, this essence-existence distinction is what makes it possible for there to be more than one instance or member of a kind or class of immaterial or incorporeal things, which angels are. But if, some, but if in something there is no distinction between its essence and its existence, if its essence just is existence, as God understood as subsistent being, being itself would be, then there is no way to distinguish different instances of this kind of thing. In short, without an actuality potentiality distinction in God or an essence existence distinction in God, there is no way even in principle, even in theory, for there to be more than one thing that has the divine nature. Hence, there cannot be more than one God. Okay. Um, now, this is all very compressed, of course, but again, I'm here merely summarizing lines of argument that I develop in considerable detail in my book, Five Proofs of the Existence of God. I'm not trying to sell books, by the way. That would be extremely tacky. I'm just telling them. I mean, I, I, if you want to know, I do say more about it there. Also, Christmas is coming, and the book, <laughs> the book fits perfectly into a stocking, I, I find. I'm just, just mentioning that in passing. Now, what I'll be talking about what I'll be talking about this evening is the nature of this unique divine first cause and of his relationship to the world, as this is understood within uh, what I've called the classical theist tradition. The topic is a very large one, and in, what to say, in five proofs, I devote a chapter about 80 pages to it. I feel so cheap right now. But <laughs> By the way, though, the book, though, is pretty cheap, too. You can, you can pick up... <laughs> a, a, Anyway, the topic's a very large one, and in, in the book I devote a chapter of about 80 pages to it, essentially a small book within the larger book. So naturally here I can't cover all the ground that I cover there, so I'll focus on just a few key issues surrounding the nature of God, the divine attributes. In particular, I'm going to talk about the doctrine of divine simplicity, which is central to classical theism and how it differs from theistic personalism or neotheism. Also about God's omnipotence and omniscience, the idea of God being all-powerful and all-knowing and about the doctrines of divine conservation and concurrence, which have to do with the, the way in which God relates to the world and keeps it going from moment to moment. However, investigating the nature of God and of his relationship to the world requires the application of three general philosophical principles. So let me first say a little bit about those. And you see those referred to there on the middle of the, of the handout. So we're at, uh, follow our little road map here, we're at Roman numeral two there. on understanding the divine nature and some key um, background principles. So the first of these background principles, to which you see referred to uh, on the handout there, is known as the principle of proportionate causality. Principle of proportionate causality, which states that whatever is in an effect, 
must be in its cause, insofar as a cause cannot give what it does not first have. Whatever is in the effect must be in the cause of that effect, otherwise it couldn't have got there in the effect. To be more precise, the principle holds that whatever is in an effect must be in its total cause in some way or other, whether, to use the, the technical jargon, whether formally, virtually, or eminently. I know you're already thinking, I, I wish this guy would throw a little more technical terminology at me, so <laughs> I'm happy to oblige. So whatever's in the effect must be in the cause in some way, whether formally, virtually, or eminently. So what does that mean? Well, a simple example will illustrate the idea. Suppose I give you a $20 bill. Your having it is the effect. That's the effect, the situation of you having $20. One way in which I could cause you to have it is by virtue of having a $20 bill in my wallet and just handing it to you. That's, that's the case where what's in the effect, you having the $20, is in the cause in a formal way, to use the technical jargon. In other words, I have the form, or fit the pattern, of possessing a $20 bill, and then I cause you to have the same form, or to fit the same pattern. Again, that would be a case of what is in the effect being in the cause formally, in a formal way. But it might be that I don't have a $20 bill on hand, ready to give you, but I do have at least $20 in the bank, and I can wire the money from my account to yours, uh, so that you can withdraw it from an ATM. In that case, what is in the effect, namely you having $20 at the end of the process, was in the total cause, me plus my bank account, etc., virtually rather than formally. I didn't actually, I didn't formally have $20. I didn't have the form or fit the pattern of something having a $20 bill, but I virtually had $20 because I had it in my, my bank account. Or it might be, third option, that I don't have even $20 in my bank account, but I do somehow have access to a U.S. Federal Reserve uh, printing press, and I can get a genuine $20 bill printed off for you on demand. In that case, what's in the effect is in the total cause, me, plus the printing press, etc., in an eminent way. It's in there eminently. This is the third way. For while in this case, I don't have an actual $20 bill or even $20 in the bank, I would have something even more fundamental, something more eminent, like a higher order sort of power, causally speaking, namely the power to make do $20 bills. And they'd be real $20 bills because it'd be an actual government printing press. It wouldn't be counterfeit. Now, I defend this principle at some length as well out, uh, in the book and elsewhere. It follows straightforwardly from uh, what's called the principle of causality and the principle of sufficient reason, both of which I also defend at length in the book. These are, these are well-known philosophical principles. They are, like everything else in philosophy, controversial. Um, but uh, for the interested reader, you can find them in these other places. Briefly, if there were some aspect of an effect that didn't come from its total cause, if the principle of, of what I'm calling the principle of proportionate causality were false, then this would involve something having a potentiality that was actualized without anything doing the actualizing. And that would violate what's called the principle of causality, which says that when something comes into being, when it goes from potential to actual, something already actual makes that happen. So if there was something in the effect that didn't get there from the cause, we'd be violating that principle. Or if that were to happen, if you, if you had something in the effect that didn't come from the total cause, that would be an aspect of the effect that lacked any explanation. And that would violate what's called the principle of sufficient reason, which says that for anything that exists, any event that occurs, there is a reason or explanation sufficient or adequate to account for it. Uh, now, again, I say a lot more uh, about this in the book and elsewhere and defend those principles for anyone who doubts them. But for present purposes, suffice it to note that what I have to say about the nature of God and its relationship to the world this evening will presuppose this first principle, the principle of proportionate causality. Okay. Now we come to a second key background principle. What Aquinas and other scholastic philosophers called the thesis agere sequitur esse. My Latin pronunciation is probably horrible. The worst place to start pronouncing Latin when you don't have a Latin background <laughs> is in a seminary, and foolishly I'm, I'm doing this. But this Latin for action follows being. Action, the way a thing acts follows its nature, follows the kind of thing that it is. The basic idea is that what a thing does necessarily reflects what it is. Eyes and ears function differently because they are structured differently. Plants take in nutrients, grow and reproduce, while stones do none of these things, because the former are living things and the latter are inanimate, and so forth. The way the thing acts, the, the way it operates, reflects the kind of thing that it is. Now this thesis can be understood as an application in the context of what Aristotelian philosophers call formal causes of the basic idea that the principle of proportionate causality expresses with respect to efficient causes, to use some Aristotelian jargon. <coughs> 
An efficient cause is what brings about the existence of something or a change in something. The principle of proportionate causality tells us, again, that whatever is in the thing that changes or comes to exist must in some way have been in the total set of factors that brought about this change or this existing thing. In this sense, the effect cannot go beyond the cause. Now, a formal cause in Aristotelian philosophy is the nature of a thing. It's what makes it the kind of thing that it is. For example, being a rational animal, you might say, is the nature of a human being. The characteristic attributes and activities of a thing flow or follow from its nature, as, for instance, the use of language flows from our nature as rational animals. The principle that action follows being basically says that these attributes and activities cannot go beyond that nature any more than an effect can go beyond its efficient cause. Hence, a stone cannot exhibit attributes and activities like nutrition, growth, and reproduction because these go beyond the nature of a stone. Anything that could do these things just wouldn't be a stone in the first place. It would be some a kind of living thing. The principle that action follows being, like the principle of proportionate causality, I would argue follows from the principle of sufficient reason. If an effect could go beyond its total efficient cause, then the part of the effect that went beyond it would have no explanation and be unintelligible, and that would violate the principle of sufficient reason. But by the same token, if a thing's activities could go beyond its nature, if, for example, a stone could take in nutrients or use language, then that activity too, that violation of the principle that action follows being, would lack an explanation and be unintelligible. And that would also there, thereby violate the principle of sufficient reason. So I say more about this principle too in the book, but for present purposes suffice it to note that this is a second principle that I will presuppose in what follows. Okay, and then the third background principle before we actually get to the divine nature is, um, that's presupposing what follows, is Aquinas' notion of the analogical use of terms, the analogical use of language, as opposed to the univocal and equivocal uses. So when I, when I make a statement like Fido is a dog, and I say Rover is a dog, I'm using the term, the term dog univocally, or in the same sense, the very same meaning. When I say there was a bat flying around the attic, and then I say, uh, another, I utter another sentence, I swung the bat at it, I'm using this, now I'm using the term bat equivocally or in completely different and unrelated senses. So when I use a term in a univocal way, I'm using it in exactly the same sense. When I use it in an equivocal way, I'm using it in totally unrelated senses. Baseball bat and the kind of bat that flies around the attic, completely different kinds of thing. Now, the analogical use of terms is a third and intermediate kind of usage. When I say this wine is still good and George is a good man, I'm not using the term good in exactly the same sense since the goodness of wine is a very different thing from the goodness of a man, but the two uses are not utterly different and unrelated either. The goodness of the one is analogous to the goodness of the other, even if it's not exactly the same thing. Okay, so the, we say the wine is good, it tastes good, we say the man is good, we, don't, we say George is good, we don't mean that. Uh, for cannibals we might, but that's a different... <laughs> okay, sorry, I'll, I'll be here all night, be here all week. <laughs> Okay, so the goodness of the one is analogous to that of the other, even if it's not exactly the same thing. Now, we speak of the being or reality of different kinds of thing. We are once again using terms in an analogical way. For example, consider a substance and its attributes, such as a stone and the color and the shape of the stone. Both the stone on the one hand and its color and shape on the other are real, but the reality of the latter is not the same as that of the former. The color, the shape, and other attributes exist only in the stone which has them, whereas the stone itself does not exist in the same sense in another thing. Attributes modify and depend on substances in a way that substances don't modify or depend on anything else. But neither is the reality of a substance and that of its attributes totally unrelated. They're not exactly the same kind of reality, but they're not completely unrelated either. It's not as if substances are real and attributes are unreal, after all. The way that something that is a bat in the sense of a stick used in baseball is a non-bat in the sense of a flying mammal. No connection there at all. Um, hence, they have being or reality, substances and attributes, that is to say, have being or reality. Not in either a univocal sense or an equivocal sense, but in an analogical sense. There's something in the reality of an attribute that's analogous to the reality of a substance, even though it's not exactly the same thing. Now, when we predicate various attributes to God, power, knowledge, goodness, and so on, then we need to understand these terms, too, in an analogical 
rather than univocal way. That's standard view among uh, followers of St. Thomas Aquinas anyway. We are, for the Thomist, saying that there is in God something analogous to what we call power in created things, something analogous to what we call goodness in us, and so forth. Note that we are not saying that God is only metaphorically powerful, good, and so forth. Analogical language of the sort that I'm talking about here is literal. It's not metaphorical. And analogy is not always the same thing as metaphor. A man and a bottle of wine, for example, are both literally good, and a substance and its attributes are both literally real. But the terms are nevertheless not being used in a univocal way, not in exactly the same sense, not in a strictly identical sense, again, in an, in an analogical way. Now, the topic of analogy is also a lot more complicated than all that, and once again, it's something I say a lot more about in the book. The point for present purposes is just to note that Aquinas' thesis that theological language should be understood in an analogical way is a third principle that I will presuppose in what follows. Okay, so that's that, that ends section uh, two, Roman two there. So now we move on to uh, section three on some key divine attributes. With these background ideas in place, the principle of proportionate causality, the principle that action follows being, and the analogy of being, let's turn to the question of what we can deduce concerning the nature of the God whose existence is established, or so I argue, by arguments like the Aristotelian and Thomistic proofs. What are the attributes of God? Can we know, what can we know about him beyond his being the cause of the world, etc.? Let's begin with the doc, what's called the doctrine of divine simplicity, according to which God is absolutely simple in the sense that he's in no way composed or made up of parts of any kind, whether physical parts or metaphysical parts. This is a very abstract doctrine. It's at one level somewhat dry, but it's also extremely important and central for, for St. Thomas and for other uh, uh, classical theists properly to understand the nature of God and how radically different God is from anything in the created world and how radically he is from the world. Um, the basic argument for divine simplicity is that whatever has parts of any kind requires a cause, something distinct from it, that accounts for those parts being combined. Hence, since God is the ultimate uncaused cause of things, he must be simple or without parts. It's a fairly direct line of reasoning for the classical theist. If God is ultimate, if he's where the buck stops metaphysically, if there's nothing more fundamental to reality than God, and everything else we say about God follows from that, he must be simple in this sense of being non-composite. Not simple in the sense of being easy to understand. In fact, the paradox is that God's extremely difficult for us to get our minds around, extremely difficult for us to understand precisely because he's so simple because he's not made up of parts. What does that mean exactly? And there's no real paradox there because I'm using the term in different senses, but hope to explain that as we go along here. Okay, now, it cannot be emphasized too strongly that the unity of God is inseparable from his simplicity. If there were in God a distinction between his essence and his existence, or between actuality and potentiality, if God had those sorts of parts, there's the essence or nature of God, and there's God's existence or there's actuality in God, and then there are potentialities in God. Those are kinds of parts, metaphysical parts, even if not physical parts. And if there were such distinctions in God, then there could, in theory, be more than one God. God's, uh, because as I noted earlier, anything in which there's a distinction between its essence and existence, or between its actualities and potentialities, there can be one, more than one member of the class or category in that sense. So if there could be such a thing in God, then there could, in theory, be more than one God. God's status as first cause is also inseparable from his simplicity. If there were in God a distinction between actuality and potentiality, or his essence and his existence, or any other parts at all, then again, he would, like everything else, require a cause of his own. There'd have to be something outside him that accounts for or explains how those parts come together so that you have uh, God exist. Hence, to deny that God is simple or non-composite is implicitly to deny his uniqueness and his ultimacy. To deny that, it's implicitly really to deny the, the, the basic idea of monotheism and the basic idea of God as being the uncaused cause of all things other than himself. Insofar as such a denial makes of God a mere instance of a genus, of a general category, it reduces him to the status of a member of a pantheon of gods, and it does so even if we think of him as the unique member. After all, the nature of a Zeus or an Odin would not change even if um, they became the sole occupants of Olympus and Asgard, respectively. 
Insofar as such a denial makes of God yet one further thing in need of a cause, it reduces him to the level of a creature, in effect. And it does so even if we think of him as somehow the one creature who happens to lack a cause. Into the bargain, allowing that there could be some composite thing which lacked a cause would also undermine the very arguments that got us to God in the first place. You, then you'd be denying that what is made of parts requires a cause. And that's the, the f foundation of, of some of the arguments for God's existence, like the ones I summarized earlier. Neither would any of this change, even if we continue to insist that God is immaterial and, in, and incorporeal, not a bodily thing, as Zeus and Odin and the creatures familiar to us in everyday experience are not. For we would still have reduced God to what is, in essence, nothing more than a kind of super angel. Worshipping him would therefore constitute a kind of idolatry. Indeed, to deny that there is anything simple or non-composite would really entail atheism, because it implicitly denies that there really is anything having the ultimacy definitive of God. Now, I'm making it sound like there are real high stakes involved in divine simplicity, and indeed there are. And it's not just me who says this. For reasons like these, the ones I've just summarized, the mainstream of the Western tradition in philosophical theology, whether in the thought of pagan philosophers like Aristotle and Plotinus, uh, Jewish philosophers like Moses Maimonides, Muslims like Avicenna and Averroes, or Christians like Athanasius, Augustine, Anselm, and Aquinas, uh, the tradition has always insisted on divine simplicity as a non-negotiable element of any sound conception of God. It's a, sort of a common idea to all those thinkers. The Catholic Church, too, has insisted on it as a key component of basic orthodoxy, teaching it as binding doctrine at the Fourth Lateran Council and the First Vatican Council. It is also affirmed by Protestant thinkers like Luther and Calvin. The doctrine of divine simplicity has, accordingly, come to be regarded as the core of classical theism, which is represented by all those thinkers in, in those traditions uh, that I just referred to. Nevertheless, there has in recent decades been resistance to the doctrine from, of all people, certain theologians and philosophers of a broadly theistic bent. These writers have been characterized, uh, as I noted earlier, as neo-theists and theistic personalists to distinguish them from the classical theist tradition against which they are reacting. The view is called theistic personalism because it essentially treats God as the unique, the unique member of a species falling under the genus person, alongside other species of persons like human beings and angels and differing from them in lacking their limitations on power, knowledge, goodness, etc. Now note that what distinguishes neotheism or theistic personalism from classical theism is not that it regards God as personal as opposed to impersonal. This is a very common misunderstanding and it's, it's one I, that actually kind of annoys me a little because I, I clarify this constantly and people keep us attacking a straw man. The classical theist is not saying God is impersonal by no means. So that's not the difference between the two views. Since most classical theists attribute intellect and will to God, they too generally regard God as personal. Rather, what sets the views apart is that theistic personalists regard God's being personal as entailing that he falls under a genus. He's like one member of a general category alongside others. And that in this and other ways, he is not simple or non-composite for reasons having to do with the metaphysics of classification. So, if you fall under a genus, you're, you're sort of one member of a, you're, you're a species under a genus, and then you have to differ from other species in that genus, and that requires you have a differentia that differenti your, differentiates your species from others in the same genus. Well, that means now you've got parts. If you've got parts, you have a cause, and so on and so forth. That's kind of what's going on in the background here. Now, Alvin Plantinga is one prominent neo-theist or theistic personalist critic of the doctrine of divine simplicity. Commenting on Aquinas' defense of the doctrine, Plantinga claims that the doctrine holds that, quote, God is identical with each of his properties, which entails that, continuing to quote from Plantinga here, each of his properties is identical with each of his properties, so that God has but one property, unquote. Okay, this is from Plantinga's book, Does God Have a Nature?, where he criticizes the doctrine of divine simplicity. But this, uh, Plantinga complains, this doctrine that he attributes, this thesis that he attributes to the doctrine of divine simplicity, Plantinga complains that it, quote, seems flatly incompatible with the obvious fact that God has several properties, such as power and mercifulness. And it also entails absurdly that God is himself a kind of property and therefore a mere abstract object, so Plantinga claims. But unfortunately, Plantinga badly misunderstands the doctrine because he interprets it in light of a metaphysics of his own that Aquinas and other defenders of divine simplicity would regard as completely wrong-headed. First of all, Plantinga applies the term property extremely broadly, 
to almost anything we might predicate of something. So we say, for example, that Socrates was human, that he was wise, that he walked around barefoot, that he was married to Xanthippe, that he was Plato's teacher, and so forth. Hence, for Plantinga, being human, being wise, being barefoot, being married to Xanthippe, and being Plato's teacher are all, quote, properties of Socrates, as Pl Plantinga uses that term. Indeed, being Socrates, according to Plantinga, is a property of Socrates. And among the thing's properties as well, Plantinga says, are its nature or essence. Second, Plantinga speaks of these properties, as he calls them, as if they existed in a platonic third realm of abstract objects, like the forms for which Plato, which for Plato, concrete individual things participate in or exemplify, as familiar from Plato's famous theory of forms. Third, Plantinga interprets predications of properties to God and to created things in a univocal way rather than an analogical way. When we say that Socrates is wise and that God is wise, the word wise is, in Plantinga's view, to be understood in the same sense in each case. Now, if you give Plantinga all these assumptions, then it's no surprise that the doctrine of divine simplicity seems highly problematic to him. Power and knowledge, for example, are distinct things in us. Hence, if God has power and knowledge in exactly the same sense in which we do, how could his power and knowledge also fail be, to be distinct? contrary to what the doctrine of divine simplicity says. Or if God is identical to his power, as the doctrine of divine simplicity claims, and power is a property in planning a sense, then how could God fail to be a property himself? And if properties are platonic abstract objects, then how could God fail, given all that, to be an abstract object? Okay, so if you give planning these assumptions he's reading into Aquinas, then yeah, all these crazy conclusions seem to follow. However, Aquinas and most uh, other classical theists would reject each of Plantinga's metaphysical assumptions. First of all, and as we've seen, when we predicate knowledge or power to God, we are, for most classical theists anyway, not using the terms knowledge and power in the same sense as when we predicate knowledge or power to human beings or to other created things. Rather, what we are saying is that there is in God something analogous to what we call knowledge in us, something analogous to what we call power in us, and so forth. Hence, the what we call knowledge and power in us are certainly distinct things. It doesn't follow that we call knowledge and power in God must be distinct, because the latter are not exactly the same as the former, even if they are related. They're, again, analogical. To be sure, Plantinga does briefly discuss the idea that language about God is to be understood analogically rather than univocally, but unfortunately, he badly misunderstands that claim as well. For one thing, he characterizes Aquinas' view as the thesis that, quote, our language about God is analogical rather than literal, unquote. But as I emphasized earlier, the analogical uses of language in question in Aquinas' account are literal uses of language, not metaphorical ones. Not to be non-univocal does not entail being non-literal. Planning is just confused about this. For another thing, planning supposes that the analogical use of language is intended as a way to understand the claim that God is a property and he finds that claim implausible, even so understood. He thinks, well, Aquinas is saying that God is a kind of property, and he's using the doctrine of analogy to clarify that. Well, no, that's not what Aquinas is up to. In fact, neither Aquinas nor any other classical theist would, would ever say that God is a property in the first place, whether, proper, whether the, the word property is understood univocally or analogically. The thesis is simply a straw man of planning his own devising, however unwittingly, so that his inability to find a plausible way of reading it is neither here nor there as far as uh, interpreting Aquinas is concerned. Now that brings us to a second point, which is that Aquinas and other classical theists simply would not accept Plantinga's assumptions about what an essence is or what a property is. For one thing, it is simply far too crude to lump together all the various predications that we might make of a thing, indiscriminately to apply to them the same label, namely the word properties, and then treat them as if they were on a metaphysical par. Rather, we need to distinguish the essence of a thing from its properties, its properties from its merely contingent accidents, its intrinsic accidents from mere relations that it bears to other things, and so on and so forth. For example, the essence of a human being is his rational animality. A capacity to find things amusing by contrast is not the essence, or even part of the essence of a human being, but it's nevertheless a property of human beings in the sense that it is proper to human beings to be able to find things amusing insofar as this capacity flows or follows from their being rational animals. It's a byproduct or consequence of the essence rather than being part of the essence. 
Having a certain skin color, however, is not in this sense a property of human beings because it doesn't flow or follow from being a rational animal. Having a certain skin color is instead a merely contingent accident of human beings. It is, however, an intrinsic accident insofar as having a certain skin color is something inherent in a human being himself rather than merely a matter of his being related to something else in a certain way. Socrates being the teacher of Plato, however, is by contrast, is by contrast merely a matter of his bearing a certain relation to something distinct from him rather than being something intrinsic to him. Okay, now the point is just that all of this, and I'm sort of breezing through some complex distinctions here rather quickly, but it shows that Aquinas draws all kinds of distinctions that Plantinga simply rides roughshod over by just using the term properties to cover all these different kinds of predications that we make of a thing. For another thing, as Aquinas and many other classical theists understand them, the essence of a thing, its properties, and its intrinsic accidents, contingent and otherwise, are not entities external to it. In particular, they are not abstract platonic forms which the thing instantiates or in which it participates, as Plato might put it. Rather, they are concrete, intrinsic constituents of the thing itself. For example, Socrates' rational animality is a constituent of Socrates himself, as is his property of being capable of finding things amusing, and his contingent accident of having a certain skin color. Now, since Plantinga tends to assimilate all these very different aspects of a thing under the, sing the single blanket label properties, in his sense of the word property rather than Aquinas' sense, and he treats these properties as if they were platonic abstract objects, his interpretation of the doctrine of divine simplicity does make it sound very odd indeed. For example, it sounds like the advocate of divine simplicity regards God's having created human beings as every bit essential to God as his wisdom, which is odd given that God could have refrained from creating Adam, but could, uh, could not have failed to be wise. And then it sounds like the doctrine of divine simplicity, insofar as it identifies God with his wisdom, his power, etc., is making of God an abstract object. But in fact, these odd results follow not from the doctrine of divine simplicity itself, but merely from the metaphysical assumptions that Plantinga has read into the doctrine, assumptions which proponents of the doctrine would reject. Plantinga also appears not to grasp what is at stake in the doctrine of divine simplicity. To be sure, he is aware that defenders of the doctrine maintain that if God were not simple or non-composite, then he would depend on something external to him. But he seems to think of the dependence in question as in merely uh, platonic terms, as a matter of God's participating in various platonic properties, like participating in a platonic form or something. Now that would, for the classical theist, be bad enough, but the problem goes well beyond that. The problem, as we've seen, is that whatever is composite or non-simple is causally dependent on something else, and thus cannot be the first cause, cannot be the uncaused cause. And that what has an essence distinct from its existence cannot be unique. Which, which means we would be getting rid of monotheism. The rationality and animality that define human beings, for example, can in principle exist apart from one another. Hence, there must be some cause which combines them so that human beings exist. And similarly, if God's wisdom and power, say, were distinct, then there would have to be some cause which combines them so that God exists. If God were merely one existing thing which participated in the divine essence, like participating in a platonic form, or if, if he were a single member of a genus, of a general category, then there could at least be in, princ in principle be more than one god. There could at least in principle be some other member of that category. Monotheism in that case would not be true in principle, but at most only as a matter of contingent fact. In both of these respects, God would lack the ultimacy that is definitive of him. That is to say, he would not really exist at all. Rather, it would exist instead is merely a quasi-divine ersatz, a god, quote-unquote, lowercase g, in the sense of a very powerful but nevertheless essentially creaturely being. And the next thing you know, they'd be making a Marvel movie out of him. Okay, he'd be merely like uh, Odin in the Thor movies or something. But in fact, we would not be justified. Actually, it sounds kind of like a cool movie. I'm, it, never mind, digress. <laughs> Stan Lee died today, by the way. It's, so say a prayer for, for his soul tonight. Um, Marvel Comics guy. Okay. Um, but in fact, we would not be justified in saying even that that sort of God exists if we took this route. Or at least nothing in arguments like the Aristotelian and Thomistic proofs would justify the conclusion that such a theistic personalist or neo-theist God exists. For such arguments entail that there must be a cause which is in no way a mixture of actuality and potentiality or of essence and existence or in any other way composite. As arguments for a first cause, they are ipso facto, by that very fact, arguments for an absolutely simple 
or non-composite cause. In short, classical theism and the doctrine of divine simplicity necessarily go together. Divine simplicity and the sort of arguments for God's existence that I summarized at the beginning of the talk necessarily go hand in hand. You really can't have one without the other. To deny the one is implicitly to deny the other. Hence, again, from the classical theist point of view, to deny divine simplicity is implicitly to affirm atheism. But as arguments like the Aristotelian and Thomistic proofs that I summarized earlier show, atheism is false. Hence, the doctrine of divine simplicity must be true. Now, objections to the doctrine, and just a little more to say about divine simplicity, it's the, it, it is the most difficult part of the talk, so it'll get easier from here on after just another page or so. Okay, so. I know I've already lost all number, any number of book sales. I want to think about it. Okay, so. <laughs> um, objections to the doctrine raised by other recent philosophers are no better than those leveled by Plantinga. For example, it's sometimes claimed that divine simplicity is incompatible with the thesis that while some things are necessarily true of God, others are true only contingently. For example, it is necessarily true that God is omnipotent but it's only contingently true that he created the world, since he could have refrained from creating it. But, judges uh, philosopher Thomas Morris, quote, there seems to be no other good way to capture this truth than to say that God is both necessary and contingent properties. And since a necessary property cannot also be a contingent property, it would follow from that that not all of God's properties can be identical, which means he's got distinct properties, which means he's not really simple or, or non-composite. That's where Morris is leading with all this. Now, leave aside the point that I've already emphasized that the term property is being used here in a way that Aquinas and other proponents of divine simplicity would not use it. There's another problem with Morris's objection, as has been pointed out by the philosopher Barry Miller. Building on a distinction made by Peter Geech, Miller differentiates between what he calls real properties and mere Cambridge properties, uh, momentarily to adopt for ease of exposition, planning as in Morris's broad sense of the term property. For example, for Socrates to grow hair is a real change in Socrates. It's the acquisition by him of a real property. But for Socrates to become shorter than Plato, not because Socrates' height has changed, but only because Plato has grown taller, is not a real change in Socrates, but only what Geech called a mere Cambridge change. He's, naming this, he's labeling this after certain Cambridge University philosophers who, who made this distinction. And therefore, it involves the acquisition of a mere Cambridge property. You've got a mere Cambridge property if you've got the property only because of a certain relation you have to someone else. So I used to be taller than my son and now my son, now I'm shorter than my son. That's not because I've changed, because he's changed, right? So it's a, it's a mere Cambridge change in me, a mere Cambridge property of being shorter than my son. Didn't involve any change internal to me, but just in my relations to his height. Now the doctrine of divine simplicity does not entail that God has no contingent properties of any sort, but only that he has no contingent real properties. He can have contingent Cambridge properties, to use this technical jargon. And just as Socrates being shorter than Plato is a mere Cambridge property, because it involves Plato's growing taller rather than any change in Socrates himself, so too is God's having created the world a mere Cambridge property, because it, it involves the world's coming into being rather than any change in God himself. Similarly, divine simplicity properly understood does not entail that all of God's properties are identical, again to use the term property in Morris's sense, of the term for the sake of argument, but implies rather only that all of his real properties are identical. Now, omnipotence is one of God's real properties and one that he has necessarily, whereas creating the world is a mere Cambridge property and one that he has only contingently, so that, as Morris says, God's omnipotence and his having created the world cannot be identical. But that is not a problem for the doctrine of divine simplicity because it does not imply in the first place, the doctrine doesn't imply in the first place, that these properties are identical, because it's apples and oranges, real properties versus Cambridge properties. Okay. Now, so much then for divine uh, simplicity. And you could maybe understand now why I say that God's difficult to understand because he's so simple, right? But the basic reason for saying that is not just because of all the technical jargon that I had to use in order to, to defend the doctrine. But the idea is that the way the human mind works is by breaking things down into their parts. If you think of a way a simple object works, like a like a, a pen that you might use on a marker board, right? You understand it by, at least mentally, if not literally and physically, decomposing it, breaking it down to its parts. You say, okay, it's got this casing, and that casing holds this fiber, this fibrous thing, which holds ink. So it's got the fibrous thing, which holds the ink, it's got the ink itself, it's got the casing, which keeps the ink from being dried out. It's got this little pen cap you put on the end so it doesn't dry out the tip of the pen. 
ah, now I understand how this, things work, how this thing works. I've broken it down to its parts. See how the parts are arranged. Or in a more abstract way, we, we understand something by breaking it down into its metaphysical parts. So we understand what it is to be a human being. We say, well, to be a human being is to be a rational animal. That's Aristotle and Aquinas' famous definition. So to be human is to have both animality, an animal nature, and a rational nature, capacity to think and to reason and so forth. Ah, okay, that's what a human being is. So I, I understand human nature by decomposing it or breaking it into its component parts, its constituent parts. That's how the human mind tends to understand things, by breaking them down into their parts and seeing how they're assembled. You can't do that with God, however, because God is not composed of parts. And so the normal human mode of cognition, the way we understand things, doesn't apply when we get to God. And so while we can certainly have a grasp of God and His nature, it's, a, it's like a fingertips grasp because God's nature is so radically different from the sort of thing that our minds are sort of naturally built to encounter and understand. So in that, in that sense, I say God's difficult to understand because, precisely because He's so simple. He's not simple in the sense of easy to understand because he is simple in the metaphysical sense of not being composed of parts. Okay. Now, uh, so much then for divine simplicity, but I just referred to God's being omnipotent or all-powerful. So let's turn to that. Let's turn to a second attribute. And notice here we're coming farther down the, the handout here. Point B under Roman 3 uh, on omni omnipotence. Okay, so power is the capacity to act or to make, to make something happen, say. Now, arguments for God's existence, like the Aristotelian and Thomistic proofs, are arguments for a cause of the existence of things. And causing things to exist is a kind of acting, and it's a kind of making. Naturally, then, there is power in God. The arguments themselves point to that. But, but, but God does not merely have power. He is all-powerful or omnipotent. And there are several ways to see this. Consider first that anything that exists or could exist other than God would have potentials that need actualization. They would have parts that need to be combined and in essence distinct from its existence. We've also seen that such things can exist even for an instant only insofar as they are caused by that which is purely actual, absolutely simple, and subsistent being itself, namely God as, as uh, classical theism characterizes him. And we've seen that there cannot in principle be more than one such cause it follows from all that that anything that exists or could exist other than God depends at every instant on God for its existence. There's one cause to which everything traces, and it's a cause that's utterly unique because it's absolutely simple, and so on and so forth. Now recall also the principle that action follows being, according to which a thing's attributes and activities cannot go beyond its nature. When we combine this principle with the thesis that the sheer existence of anything at any moment depends on God's causing it to exist, we get the result that the operation or activity of anything at any moment also depends on God. For, a thing, for if a thing could not even exist for an instant apart from God, how could it act at any instant apart from God? If the thing has no independent capacity for existence, where could an independent capacity for action possibly come from? Existing, after all, is more fundamental than acting, since it's presupposed by acting or doing things. So if a thing's essence gives it no capacity even to exist apart from God, it cannot intelligibly give it power to act apart from God. And so everything that exists or could exist other than God depends at every instant, not only for its existence, but also its, on its, for its capacity to do anything on God. For example, the sun could not continue in existence even for a second, even for an instant, if God weren't sustaining it in being. But it also couldn't act or operate. That is to say, it couldn't heat other objects, for example. It couldn't, you know, the sun wouldn't shine even for an instant, let alone exist, if God weren't in constantly imparting to it power to act, power to do those things. And the same thing would be true of every physical thing. Trees couldn't grow even for a moment. Stones couldn't shatter windows even for a moment if God were not only keeping them in existence, but keeping their powers operating, keeping them active. Nothing that exists or could exist is outside the range of his power uh, or has any power that does not derive from him. But to be that from which all power derives and which has nothing outside the range of its power just is to be all-powerful or omnipotent. Hence, God is all-powerful or omnipotent. Okay. Um, so that's one way to think about divine omnipotence. Nothing could exist even for an instant if God weren't keeping it in existence. And given that action follows being, the way a thing acts or what it does reflects what it is, if something couldn't even 
exist for an instant apart from God. It couldn't act or do anything apart from God. So there's nothing that exists or no exercise of any power that ultimately doesn't trace to what God is doing. So if God is the source of the, 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 actual, the um, operation of any power, any actual or possible power, that's an obvious sense in which God is omnipotent or all-powerful. Recall also that of his very nature or essence, God exists in a fully actual way as that which just is subsistent existence itself rather than something which in any way derives existence from anything else. Factor in once again the principle that action follows being, that, it thinks at, that, it, that is to say that a thing's attributes and activities reflect what it is, and consider that to do or to make something is to actualize some potential, so that to have power is to have the capacity to actualize potential. It follows from all that that since God exists in the fullest possible way, he must also have the capacity to act in the fullest possible way. Action follows being. So if he has being in the fullest possible way and action follows being, he must have the capacity to act or to make things happen in the fullest possible way. Think about it that way. Hence, there is no potential that he cannot actualize and thus nothing outside the range of his power. For suppose that there was some potential that could be actualized, but that God couldn't actualize it. What could possibly prevent him from doing so? What could prevent him from acting in that particular possible way if he exists in the fullest possible way, given that action follows being, given that uh, the, way, the way a thing acts or operates, or could act or operate, reflects what it is. So whether we start with God's effects and work back to, uh, backward to his nature, or we start with his nature itself and work forward to his attributes, we arrive at the same result, namely that God is all-powerful or omnipotent. Okay, now we move on to omniscience the attribute of being all-knowing. As with omnipotence, so too with omniscience, we can show that God possesses it either by working backward from his effects to the nature of the cause or by working forward from God's nature. Again, anything that exists or could exist and anything that something does or could do depends at every moment on God's causal action. Now recall the principle of proportionate causality according to which whatever is in an effect must in some way be in its cause. It follows from these two propositions that whatever is in anything that exists or could exist must in some way be in God as their cause. And so in some way or other, colors, sounds, shapes, sizes, spatial locations, atomic structures, chemical compositions, surface reflectance properties, nutritive powers, locomotive capacities, and every other feature of everything that exists or might exist, such as self-promoting jokes during the course of a lecture. <laughs> Whether mineral, vegetable, animal, human, or angel, all of that must exist in God in some sense, must pre-exist in God. Now, because those are the effect, those are all part of the world that God keeps in, re keeps in being, keeps real, keeps in being from moment to moment to moment, whatever's in the effect must be in the cause, so all those attributes, of the, those aspects of the effect must be in God as their cause. Now obviously these features cannot exist in God in the same way that they exist in all these effects. For example, God cannot be of a certain color, shape, or chemical composition because these are all essentially features of material objects and God is immaterial since he's purely actual. Anything that's material has potentiality. If God is purely actual and no potentiality, he can't be a material thing. But God's being immaterial is not the only reason these features cannot exist in him in the way that the, they do exist in other things. Even if God were material, if he merely instantiated redness and roundness, for example, if he was merely one instance or example of a red object or a round object among others, then he wouldn't be the ultimate cause of all red and round things. For in that case, his own redness and roundness, being mere instances or special cases, examples of universal forms or patterns, would themselves require explanation just as much as other instances do. And the same thing is true of any features that angels, who are immaterial, might possess. If God merely instantiated those features just as angels do, then he couldn't be the ultimate cause of all things, uh, all the things which do have those features. Now the Thomist would argue, follower of Thomas Aquinas would argue, that redness and roundness and other universal patterns are real. That is to say, nominalism and conceptualism, the alternatives to realism, are false. Okay, this is a, another famous background dispute in philosophy. That Universal patterns, the former pattern of being round or red or what have you, these are not inventions of the human mind. They, we discover them, we don't invent them. They're really out there in some sense. Following Aristotle, Thomists also argue that where universals don't exist in the concrete individual things 
which instantiate them, they don't exist, for example, in the physical world, then the only other way that they might exist is as concepts or ideas in an intellect, in a mind. There is no platonic third realm for them to be denizens of. Uh, again, these are also further claims that I defend at length elsewhere, such as in the book. So if redness, roundness, and all the other universal forms are patterns that everything that exists or might exist exhibit, don't exist in God in the way in which they exist in the concrete individual things which instantiate them, then the only other way in which they can exist in God is as concepts or ideas in an intellect. But again, they must exist in God in some way, given the principle of proportionate causality, so it follows that they exist in Him as concepts or ideas in an intellect, and so we have to attribute intellect to God or mind to God. So the basic idea of this argument that I'm summarizing here is that everything that exists or could exist is caused by God and caused by Him at every moment, kept in existence by God. Whatever is in the effect must be in the cause. So all the forms or patterns we see in the world around us, the form or pattern of being red or round or tall or having a certain chemical composition or a certain atomic structure, all of those forms or patterns have to exist in God as the cause, because whatever is in the effect must be in the cause. But they can't exist in God the way that they exist in the effect. Redness can't exist in God as, say, the surface of a physical object, because God's not a physical object. The only other way for them to exist in God is as ideas or concepts in an intellect. That's the only other option on the Platonic background, Plato, uh, sorry, Aristotle, Aquinas metaphysics. So we have to attribute something like intellect or mind to God in order to make sense of all this. Nor is it just concepts which exist in this divine intellect. Consider a cat sitting on a mat. That the cat and the mat exist at all at any instant at which they do exist is due to God's causal activity. But that the state of affairs of the cat's being on the mat holds at any instant is also due to God's causal activity. Not just the cat, not just the mat, but that state of affairs or circumstance of the cat being on the mat, the one being on the other. That also is true at any moment because God is causing it to be the case. He's causing the world, keeping it in existence. So just as, given the principle of proportionate causality, the catness of the cat as a former pattern must exist in God as a concept, the concept of catness or being, being a cat, so too must the state of affairs of the cat's being on the mat in some way exist in God. In particular, it must exist as the proposition that the cat is on the mat. You might say as the thought that the cat is on the mat. For just as the concept catness is the correlate within an intellect, within a mind, of the universal form or pattern uh, of being a cat that exists in actual cats, so too the proposition or statement that the cat is on the mat, considered as the content of a thought, is the correlate within an intellect or mind of the state of affairs of the cat's being on the mat. And just as the concept of anything that might exist would have to be in God's intellect, so too must the propositions corresponding to any state of affairs that might obtain in the world exist as thoughts in the divine intellect, since these states of affairs can obtain only insofar as God causes them to. Okay, so what I'm arguing is that we have to say that there, is in God not, there are in God not only concepts or ideas, but also propositions or thoughts, complete thoughts. We're attributing, in other words, a variety of mental activities, intellectual attributes to, to God, to the divine nature. Naturally, among the states of affairs that obtain are the state of affairs that the proposition that the cat is on the mat is a true proposition, and the state of affairs that the proposition that unicorns exist is a false proposition. So thoughts corresponding to these states of affairs will also be among those that are in the divine intellect, in the divine mind. That is to say, there is in the divine intellect the thought that it is true that the cat is on the mat, the thought that it is false, that unicorns exist, and so forth. Furthermore, since everything that exists or might exist other than God, and every state of affairs that obtains or might obtain other than God's existence depends on God's causal activity, all propositions about such things will be true or false only because God causes the world to be such that these propositions are either true or false. God is like an author who comes up with a story in a single instantaneous flash of insight. Such an author can hardly be mistaken about whether a certain character exists in the story or about whether such and such a situation involving the character occurs in the story. Nor could the author be mistaken at that instant about whether at that, at that instant he has framed the story in just that way. Similarly, God can hardly be mistaken about whether he is causing such and such things to exist or such and such states of affairs to obtain, and thus can he hardly be mistaken about whether such and such things really do exist or such and such states of affairs really do obtain. So we're building up to the idea not only of God having intellect or knowledge, but having all knowledge, of being a, an omniscient mind.
Now, of course, the analogy with the author is not perfect. A human author might go on to forget some of the details of the story that he came up with. But that is because the human author exists in time, transitions from one cognitive state to another, knows what he knows in part by virtue of brain processes which can malfunction, and is otherwise subject to forces outside of his control, which, he, uh, which might cause him to forget. But none of those things is true of God, who is immaterial, who is immutable or unchangeable, and omnipotent, outside of time and space, etc. Now, on the standard philosophical account of knowledge, the standard analysis of what knowledge is, one can be said to know some proposition, P, whatever P is, we, it's a variable for a proposition, when A, one thinks that P is true, B, P really is true, and C, one thinks that P is true as a result of some reliable process of thought formation. You got all three of those conditions, you can be said to have knowledge. Again, if you know that P, you know that the cat is on the mat, if the cat really is on the, uh, if you think the cat is on the mat, the cat really is on the mat, and you arrived at that knowledge through a reliable sort of process. If you got those three criteria, then you could be said to have knowledge. Now, each of these conditions, or rather, keeping in mind the doctrine of analogy, something analogous to each of them, is true of God. Again, consider the proposition that the cat is on the mat. We have seen that there must be in the divine intellect the thought that it is true that the cat is on the mat. So condition A obtains. God, you know, in that sense, thinks this proposition. And it really is true that the cat is on the mat precisely because God is causing that to be the case. He's keeping the cat and the mat and that circumstance in being from moment to moment. So condition B obtains. Not only does God have the thought the cat is on the mat, but that thought is actually true. Furthermore, there can be no more reliable way of determining whether some proposition P is true than being able to make it the case that it's true. The author in our example certainly has a reliable way of finding out whether a certain character exists in his story insofar as he is the one who decided to put the character in the story in the first place. That's a pretty reliable way to know if you, you're the one who made it true. So since the cat is on the mat only insofar as God himself causes it to be the case that the cat is on the mat, God certainly has a reliable way of, quote, finding out whether such a proposition is true. So that means our third condition, condition C on knowledge, obtains. And so meeting all these conditions, we can say that God has knowledge, or something analogous to knowledge anyway. Now what is true of the proposition that the cat is on the mat is true also of every other proposition about what things exist or might exist, and what states of affairs obtain or might obtain. God knows all such propositions because he's the ultimate cause of all of them, it's being true and so forth. Moreover, he can hardly have any less knowledge about himself than he has about things other than himself. Any more than an author can know less about his own creative act of coming up with a story than he knows about the story himself, itself. Of course, a human author might not know certain other things about himself, such as what is going on at the moment in the interior uh, of his body. That is because a human author is composed of parts. His intellect is a distinct thing from his digestive system, or his circulatory system, or muscles, or bones, or what have you. But nothing like that is true of God, who is absolutely simple or non-composite. His intellect just is his power, which just is his existence, and so forth. Now, if God then can be said to, uh, to have knowledge of all propositions about himself and about everything else, then he has all knowledge. And thus we have our conclusion that God is omniscient or all-knowing. Now, the analogical use of terms is crucial to properly understanding the nature of God's knowledge. I've been speaking of various concepts and propositions existing in the divine intellect, but they can't exist there in exactly the same sense in which they exist in our intellects. For in our intellects, they exist as distinct thoughts, and there cannot be any distinctions in God uh, of that sort consistent with his simplicity. To a first approximation, we might think instead in terms of a conjunction of all propositions and say that there is in the divine intellect something like a single thought with this one gigantic conjunctive proposition as its content, just to a first approximation. But even that cannot be quite right because this single conjunctive proposition will itself have component parts. A better, though still imperfect, way to understand the nature of God's knowledge would be to think in terms of analogies like the following. From a beam of white light, various beams of colored light can be derived by passing it through a prism. Though the colors are not separated out until the beam reaches the prism, they are still in the white light in a unified way. Or, change analogies, from a lump of dough, cookies of various shapes can be derived by means of cookie cutters. Um, Though the various cookies with their particular shapes are not separated out until the cutters are applied to the dough, they are still in the uncut dough in a virtual way. 
Now, God is pure actuality, whereas each kind of created thing represents a different way in which actuality might be limited by potentiality. That is to say, each created thing is comparable to one of the different specific colors that might be derived from the white light that contains all of them, or like one of the many cookie shapes which might be derived from the dough which contains all of them. God's creation of the world is thus like the passing of white light through a prism, or the application of the cutters to the dough. The prism draws out from the color spectrum, which is contained in a unified way in the white light, a particular beam of this color and a particular beam of that color. And the cutters draw out from the variety of possible cookies contained in a unified way in the lump of dough, a cookie of this particular shape and a cookie of that particular shape. Similarly, creation involves drawing out from the unlimited actuality that is God various limited ways of being actual. To be a stone or a tree or a dog is to be actual, but it is to be actual only as a stone, only as a stone, or as a tree, or as a dog, rather than some other kind of actuality. Just as to be green is to be a color, but to be that specific color rather than, say, red or any of the other colors of the spectrum. And to be a cookie of a round shape is to be round rather than being, say, square or of any of the other shapes which might have been taken from the dough. Again, the analogy is not perfect. I'm, as I'm thinking about here, the, you know, God is cosmic baker, making cookies might sound a bit silly. I, I guess it does provide opportunities for evangelism to children, so you might have got that going for it. But again, the analogy is not perfect, but only meant to be suggestive. For one thing, created things are not made out of God in the way that cookies are made out of dough, since God, being devoid of potentiality, is not a kind of material which might take on... Um, different patterns, but the point is just that the analogy is subjective, it's suggestive, not that it's a perfect analogy. Now just as if you knew white, the white light perfectly, you would know all the colors which could be derived from it, and if you knew the lump of dough perfectly, you would, not, you would know all the shapes which might be carved out of it, so too perfectly to know that which is pure actuality would entail knowing all the various limited ways of being actual which might be derived from it being a dog as opposed to a tree or as opposed to a stone. These various ways of being actual, but only in this way rather than that. And that is how God knows all the various kinds of finitely actual things which exist or might exist. He knows them by virtue of perfectly knowing himself as that which is pure or unlimited actuality. That is not to say that his, not, his knowledge is exactly like that of someone who grasps the nature of white light or of dough, but it is analogous to that. And even if the analogy is imperfect, that is only to be expected given how very far beyond its ordinary sphere of operation reason has to push when seeking ultimate explanations. Okay, so now let me finally, we're at the bottom of the, of the handout there. I know some of this is, has been technical and difficult, but as Catholics say, offer it up, right? So <laughs> there's, there's no unredeemed suffering, even tonight. Okay, so. So now we finally turn to uh, the doctrines of the divine conservation and concurrence. Let me now say something then about God's relationship to the world. The Aristotelian and Thomistic proofs show that nothing that is distinct from God could continue in existence, even for an instant, if God were not sustaining it in being. It thereby establishes what is known as the doctrine of divine conservation, according to which the world would be instantly annihilated in the absence of divine causation. Creation is not a one-time event that occurred at some different point in the past, some dis distant point in the past. It is occurring at every moment. Okay, and this is fundamental for, for St. Thomas and for other thinkers in the classical theist tradition that creation is not merely a matter of God having caused the Big Bang, say, at some point in the past. Now, that's part of the story. That's part of the story. But it's not the whole story, and it's not, at least from a philosophical point of view, really even from a theological point of view, it's not the most fundamental way in which God can be said to be creator. After all, if, if God merely knocked down the first domino 13 billion years ago, and that's all that creation involved, you, know, you might think to say to God, well, you know, appreciate it, but what have you done for me lately, right? But, <laughs> but what God's done for us lately is something he's doing at every moment. The world could not continue even for an instant if God were not continuously keeping it in being, keeping it going. So that's the fundamental and very radical way in which God creates. He's creating the world here and now. And if he stopped, I, we would all blink out instantaneously. So it's a very radical dependence of world on God on this view. Creation's occurring at, at every instant in which anything exists at all. Now, these arguments, therefore, all also thereby answer the rival thesis of existential inertia, as it's sometimes called according to which at least some of the things that make up the world 
will, once they exist, tend to continue in existence on their own, at least until something positively acts to destroy them. Uh, if something has this kind of existential inertia, it's claimed, then it need not be conserved in being by God. It will just sort of carry on on its own, under, under its own steam. Now, one problem with this thesis is that, is that its proponents never explain exactly what it is about a material object or any other contingent thing that could give it this remarkable feature of existential inertia. It is merely suggested without argument that things might have existential inertia, as if this were no less plausible than the claim that they are conserved in being by God. So when you put forward the idea of divine conservation, sometimes the atheist says, well, maybe, just, maybe things just keep on going on their own without a need for a divine cause. They have a, let's call it existential inertia. Uh, just like an object in motion will tend to remain in motion, an object will tend to exist just under its own steam. Uh, maybe that's what's going on rather than divine causality. That's the, that's the thesis of existential inertia. But again, proponents of this thesis never explain, well, what is it about a contingent object, like a physical object, that would give it this remarkable tendency or power? It's merely suggested, well, maybe that's what's going on, without argument, as if this were no less plausible than the theist, um, uh, the theist argument. Another problem with the thesis is that no material thing, nor any other contingent thing, possibly could have such a feature as existential inertia. And the reason is that all such things are composite. They're made up of parts. Um, and in particular, are mixtures of actuality and potentiality and of essence and existence. And anything that is composite in such ways requires a sustaining cause. That's the whole point of arguments like the Aristotelian argument and the Thomistic argument that I summarized at the beginning. If something's made up of parts, if it's a mixture of actual and potential, if it has a distinct essence or nature from its existence, it requires a cause, a sustaining cause. It cannot possibly have existential inertia. So the existential inertia thesis simply ignores this without answering it, ignores those arguments without answering them. Okay, so um, any, anything that's composite in those ways requires a sustaining cause, and anyone who claims otherwise has the burden of answering arguments like the Aristotelian and Thomistic proofs, which I summarized earlier. Merely suggesting that things might have existential inertia is not to answer such arguments, but simply to ignore them. Now, though material things are at every moment dependent for their existence on God, they are distinct from God. This follows from the fact that they are composite or made up of parts, whereas God is simple or not made up of parts. It follows from the fact that the things in the world of our experience are mixtures of actual and potential, whereas God is pure actuality with no potential. And they have essences or natures distinct from their existence, whereas God just is subsistent existence itself. And so the arguments thereby rule out a pantheist conception of God, which would identify him with the world. That's ruled out. So you might say, well, maybe God exists, but he's just identical with the physical universe. No, he cannot be. He's pure act, pure actuality, no potentiality. The world's a mixture of actual and potential. It can't be the same. He's absolutely simple or non-composite, not made up of parts. The world's made up of parts. Ergo, they're not the same. Or God just is existence. He's not a mixture of essence and existence, whereas the world is made up of things which are mixtures of essence and existence. Once again, the conclusion follows God is not the same thing, therefore, as the world. So we rule out pantheism, which collapses God down into the world. The arguments also thereby rule out what's called a panentheist conception of God, according to which God is not identical with the world, but he's still present in it in such a way that he's changed or altered by it. Um, as I've argued, given that God is pure actuality and also absolutely simple, it follows he must be immutable or unchanging, in which case panentheism, like pantheism, is ruled out. Now, these two theses, these two claims, that things are dependent for their existence on God, but are distinct from him, when conjoined with the principle that action follows being, yield a conception of divine causality known as the doctrine of divine concurrence. Doctrine of divine concurrence. This is another key aspect of uh, Thomas Aquinas' conception of God and God's relationship to the world. This concurrentist position is perhaps most easily understood by comparison with two rival views, uh, where it's a kind of a middle ground between them. The two rival views being what are called occasionalism on one extreme and mere conservationism on the other. So what do these views say? Well, occasionalism holds that nothing in the created world has any causal efficacy at all. It doesn't really do anything. That only God ever really causes anything to happen. So for example, according to the occasionalist, when you leave a glass of iced tea outside and the ice cubes melt in the sun, 
It's not really the sun that causes the ice to melt. Um, rather, it's God who causes the ice to melt. That he does so on the occasion when the sun is out is what makes it falsely seem that the sun is what's melting the ice. Hence, it's called, hence the view, view is called occasionalism. Similarly, it's not really the cue ball which causes the eight ball to go into the corner pocket. Rather, it's God who causes the eight ball to go into the corner pocket on the occasion when the cue ball makes contact with it, and so on. So according to occasionalism, the first cause is the only cause, and nothing else has uh, even any secondary or derivative causal power. Okay, that's one extreme view. Basically, it says, let's just cut out the middleman. Everything that happens is really God making it happen. It's not that God gives power to things in the world to produce effects. God's producing every effect. Everything in the world is just passive. Nothing really acts at all except for God. That's occasionalism. That's one extreme that thinkers like Aquinas want to avoid. Okay. Meanwhile, on the other extreme, what's called mere conservationism, meanwhile, holds that although God keeps things in existence, they have their causal efficacy independently of Him, their ability to act independently of Him. For example, God keeps the sun in existence, but the sun melts the ice cubes independently of God. He doesn't have to give them any power to do that, give the sun any power to do that. God keeps the cue ball in existence, but the cue ball all by itself, with no assistance from God, causes the eight ball to move independently, and so on and so forth. That's the other extreme, mere, mere conservationism, as it's sometimes called. Now, concurrentism, which is Aquinas' view, rejects these two views and takes a middle ground position between them. Against occasionalism, it maintains that the sun, the cue ball, and all the other created things do have genuine causal power. They are doing things. It's not just God who's doing everything. On the other hand, against mere conservationism, on the other extreme, it maintains that created things nevertheless cannot exercise this causal power independently of God. For neither of these extreme positions can be correct, given what I've argued earlier in the paper. So consider first why occasionalism cannot be correct. Since action follows being, that is to say what a thing does necessarily reflects what it is, if something could not truly do anything, if, if uh, it had no causal efficacy at all, God were really was, uh, the only thing that's doing anything, then it would not truly exist. If it's doing nothing and what a thing does reflects what it is, then it must not have any existence at all since action follows being. Occasionalism would thus entail that God alone truly exists since only He truly does anything. And that cannot be right. For one thing, we know that things other than God do exist. Tables, chairs, rocks, trees, and so on. Even if you were seriously to entertain the possibility that those things do not really exist after all, but were somehow mere hallucinations that you were having, you would still know that you exist, and you are not identical to God. Sorry to break it to you. <laughs> <laughs> After all, the very fact that you are thinking through these various possibilities entails that you are changeable. You move from one thought to the next, to the next, whereas God is immutable or unchangeable. The fact that you would not be certain whether tables, chairs, etc. exist would show that you are not omniscient, whereas I've argued God is omniscient. The fact that you lack power in various ways, for example, you could not make yourself stop experiencing tables, chairs, etc., even if you convinced yourself that they were not real, that shows that you are not omnipotent or all-powerful, whereas, as I've argued, God is omnipotent, and so on and so forth. So you know that at least one thing other than God exists, namely yourself, which would not be true if occasionalism were true. So the problem with occasionalism is it says only God ever really does anything. But given this principle that action follows being, what a thing does reflects what it is, reflects its existence or, or, or the kind of being it has. If Created things don't really do anything. They don't really have any existence. God alone exists. The world collapses up into God, as it were. But that can't be right. You know at least of yourself that you're not God, so there, and you're part of the world. So the world in the person of yourself must be distinct from God. For another thing, even if you could coherently deny the existence of yourself along with everything else, occasionalism would still leave us with an incoherent position in another way. For we arrived at the idea of God as first cause only because we reasoned from the existence of things other than God which required Him as a cause. For example, we started with the idea that certain things are composites of essence and existence, and we inferred that there must be something that causes these component parts to be combined. And we deduced in turn that the ultimate cause must be simple or non-composite. So if we now say that God alone exists, we'd be abandoning the very grounds that led us to affirm the existence of God as first cause in the first place. It would be like someone who slowly and carefully climbs a ladder, then he pulls out a ray gun and blasts it out from under him. He would fall to the ground, making his cautious ascent entirely pointless. 
So that's why this one extreme view, occasionalism, tends, tends to collapse into pantheism, why that cannot be correct. Now consider why the other extreme view, what I call mere conservationism, cannot be correct. Since, again, action follows being, this background principle I'm appealing to, uh, again, what a thing does necessarily reflects what it is. If something could do what it does independently of God, if it could act apart from God, if it had causal power apart from any divine assistance, then it could exist apart from God, given that action follows being. We'd be left with an essentially deist conception of God, on which even if God is the creator of things, they might carry on without him once created. And this also cannot be right. For one thing, and as we've seen, nothing other than God possibly could exist even for an instant without God's conserving action. It follows from a thing's being composite rather than simple, from its being a mixture of actuality and potentiality, and from its having an essence distinct from its existence. For another thing, the resulting position would again be incoherent. For it was the idea that things cannot exist on their own even for an instant that led us to the idea of God as first cause in the first place. To say that these things might exist after all without God would once again be like climbing a ladder and then blasting it out from under one. All right, almost done here. So the correct view has to be the middle ground concurrentist position according to which secondary causes are real. That is to say, things other than God have, do have real causal power. The sun really melts the ice. The cue ball really knocks the eight ball into the corner pocket. Even if they have it only in a secondary or derivative way insofar as they derive that power from God as the first or underived cause. Occasionalism denies that secondary causes are real insofar as it says that the only, only the first cause really causes anything. Mere conservationism, on the other hand, denies that secondary causes are real insofar as it says that causes other than God have their causal power independently of Him and thus do not have it merely in a derivative or secondary way. They're really like miniature first causes all their own. Secondary causes are true causes insofar as they make a real contribution to the effect. The effect would not be of precisely the character that it is if some other secondary cause were involved instead. Secondary causes are secondary insofar as they would be inert without divine assistance. God must cooperate or concur with everything they do if they are to do anything at all, hence the label concurrentism. To borrow an example from uh, Alfred Fredoso, uh, philosopher at uh, Notre Dame, if you draw a square on a chalkboard with blue chalk, both you as the primary cause and the chalk as the secondary cause are joint causes of the effect. You of there being any square there at all and the chalk of the squares being blue. Each make a real contribution. The chalk makes a real contribution to the effect insofar as the effect would have been very different if the chalk had been red or if the writing instrument had been a pen or a pencil instead of chalk. But no effect at all would have been produced had you not pressed the chalk against the board. The chalk by itself would be inert. Or consider the moon, which gives light, but only insofar as it receives it from the sun. The moon makes a real contribution to the effect insofar as its appearance in the night sky would be very different if the soil on its surface had a different color, or if it were in other respects uh, made of a different sort of material. But it would give no light at all if there were no sunlight for it to reflect. Now, God's concurrence with the secondary causes that he conserves in existence, <clears throat> where everything in the world of our experience is a secondary cause. The sun really causes things. You really cause things. Um, the, the cue ball really causes things, but only in a secondary way. They derive their power from God. God's concurrence with all these secondary causes that he conserves in existence is analogous to your relationship to the chalk or to the sun's relationship to the moon. Now, finally, among the secondary causes with which God must concur, if they were to have any efficacy, if they were to have any power to produce any changes, are human beings. So does this entail that we lack free will? No. To borrow an example from the philosopher David Oderberg, consider a father teaching his young son how to write letters by guiding the child's hand. The child who does not yet know how to write an A, for example, the letter A, will not be able to do so unless he allows his father to guide his hand in the right direction. The child could resist his father's guidance and move his hand in the wrong direction, or he could submit to that guidance and allow it to be moved in the right direction. There's nothing in the father's guidance per se that rules out either possibility. Hence, the child's free choice of whether to resist or submit rate makes a real contribution to the effect. All the same, the, the effect, the letter A appearing on the page, will not occur without the father's guidance. God's concurrence with our free actions is analogous to that. Okay, and I sense that God is now ceasing to concur with my action of continuing to speak, so I will, I will mercifully end at that point.
and we can move on, I guess, to Q&A. Thank you.